Welcome to this video where I wanted to have a look at the Tully Fisher relation for spiral galaxies basically, and it's a relationship between the luminosity or mass of the galaxy and also its rotational velocity. And you get this kind of relation here, and it can be very useful for finding things like distances, so fairly large distances in the universe. So, very distant galaxies, you can use this relationship because you can basically measure one property and you can work out the other and then you can measure the distance. That's what we're going to have a quick look at in this video. So here you have the Tully Fisher relation, which is that straight yellow line there between the rotational velocity and the luminosity of a galaxy. So what it actually shows is that if you have a more luminous or a brighter galaxy, then its rotational velocity is going to be greater as well. And if you can measure one of those two, you can then use this relation to get the other one. So it's a very useful relation to have when looking at distant galaxies. So it basically concerns disk-like galaxies, so spiral galaxies, and also in some ways lenticular galaxies, which are a little bit different, but we're not going to discuss those here. They do have the same relation, but it's a little bit offset. So it's not exactly the same, but they do increase with one another. So it concerns disk-like galaxies like this spiral galaxy here. It doesn't concern elliptical galaxies generally because they don't have this same sort of rotational structure. So it's mostly concerned with the spiral galaxies because elliptical galaxies are more spherical in shape. They're not disc-like and not rotating like a disc. So for this, we're only concerning the spiral galaxies. So we have the tuller fisher relation there on the right. And if we know something like the luminosity or its absolute magnitude, we can then calculate a distance to the galaxy. Now, if you have used the absolute and apparent magnitude of a star to calculate its distance, then the equation is given here. So the absolute magnitude is how bright an astronomical object will be from some set distance. So it's always a, a standard distance from it, how bright it would be, that's its absolute magnitude. The apparent magnitude, which is the lowercase m, is how bright we actually see it from our observational point of Earth. And if we know those two, we can calculate the distance to it. And you know the absolute magnitude depending on the type of object that it is. So for our one here, using a galaxy, we could measure the rotational velocity, and then we could work out what its luminosity was, convert to an absolute magnitude, and then you've got your distance, basically. So how do we actually get the rotational velocity as a measurement? Well, we can use this directly by using the Doppler effect. So we measure the light coming from the galaxy. And if we've got the full galaxy, we can measure across the plane. And some of it will be traveling away from us and towards us. So it will be basically redshifted. So part of that galaxy as it's rotating is moving away from us. That would be redshifted. It means the light becomes slightly redder than it would be if it was stationary. Um, we get the same effect on the opposite side of the galaxy. It would be moving towards us slightly and it would be slightly blue shifted. And from that, we can actually get the full rotation of the galaxy. So if we look at this galaxy here, if it's completely edge on or some orientation, some of it will be rotating towards us. That's blue shifted on the left. Some of it will be moving away from us and that will be red shifted. And from that, that's what we get our rotational velocity. And actually, when you look at the light from a galaxy, if it's a very small galaxy, it's very, very far away, then you can't resolve the whole thing. But what you can do is you get the width of the line. So if you were to have an absorption line or a emission line in the spectrum, so if we go back again, those black lines there in the light are our absorption lines. And what happens is if you have parts of the galaxy moving away from us and towards us, but we can't resolve them, then it just gives you a very broad line because some of the, that line is moving away and towards us. It gives you a, like a, a Doppler broadening of that line. And that width of that line can actually give you the velocity of the galaxy. The wider the width, then the greater the velocity because more of the galaxy is traveling, well, it's traveling faster and slower in our line of sight. And this is an example, really, of M33. This is a, a galaxy, and they've used the, uh, basically created a Doppler map of that. And you can see that the blue part is traveling towards us and the red part away from us. And then in the middle, it's kind of 
not quite moving away or towards as it's kind of stationary, which makes sense because it's actually moving perpendicular to our line of sight, so we don't get a Doppler effect there. So you basically can create these Doppler maps, and that again gives us our rotational velocity because we can then do a direct calculation of the velocity of that from the shift in the wavelength of light we've measured. So what you might see sometimes when you look at this Tully-Fisher relation is that the mass is sometimes used instead of the luminosity. So it can be exchanged for mass instead of luminosity. And the two are somewhat interchangeable. And why would higher luminosities then be associated with higher masses? Because we're just switching the two out really here. Well, if you think about it, what are galaxies made of? Galaxies are made of stars. So if you've got more mass, it means you've got more stars generally, not taking into account of anything else. And if you've got more stars, you've got more light. So that's where that relationship goes. That the mass is proportional to the luminosity or the brightness of that galaxy because it's related to the amount of stars in there. So it kind of makes sense there that you can then use one or the other. And depending on where you're looking, you'll see mass or luminosity discussed in this fully fisher relation. So why does it actually exist? Well, if you use the, the Virial theorem, then that relates the kinetic energy, which is K here, and the potential energy in a gravitationally bound system, which is in equilibrium. So we can use that then to work out why the rotational velocity is going to increase as we then increase our mass. So if we start with the kinetic energy, oh, we rearrange for kinetic energy, then we get this relationship here from the previous one. So it's the kinetic energy equals minus a half of the potential energy. We can then also give the equations for kinetic energy and the potential energy here. And then what we can then do is put those in and rearrange for your V. So we've got V there, haven't we? So we can then rearrange that for V. Now here, the lowercase m, let's say it's the mass of a cloud of gas in the galaxy or some smaller object in the galaxy. The uppercase m is in the mass at the center of the galaxy. So that's the larger mass. So uppercase m is going to be larger than the lowercase one in this case here. And v is the velocity of that gas or the, a smaller object in the galaxy itself. r would be your orbital radius of the cloud of gas in the galaxy, so where it is from the center. And then what we then do is we can rearrange for velocity. So the velocity squared is then going to equal the gravitational constant times the mass at the center of the galaxy divided by the, the radial position then of that object in the galaxy. And what that basically means, if you just ignore the g and the r, it means that v squared is proportional to the mass. So as you increase the mass, you increase the velocity. So larger masses, and also, which then also relates to luminosities, relates to larger velocities. So that's where that relationship basically comes from. And again, it can be very useful for finding distances because we can directly measure the rotational velocity of the galaxy. That then means we can work out the luminosity. If we can work out the luminosity, we can then convert that to an absolute magnitude and then get our distance to it. So thank you for watching. And if you enjoy, then check out some of the other videos.